How are you? That's better. For those that are watching online, they need to know there's at least 4,000 people in the room, and, and we want them to understand that. No, I said they need to know. I didn't say there was. There's a difference. How you guys doing? All right. I know a lot of people ask, why am I wearing glasses? Because I can't see without them. That's basically what it is. Um, but uh, you guys can be praying for me. I have an ulcerated cornea. Uh, and that's a fancy word that says I got a hole in my cornea. So be praying that it closes up because it would be really nice to be able to see without pain. Right? And, and I'm telling you that for this reason. I, I really can't see my notes well. So if I go off script and all of a sudden there's outline, there's fill in the blanks that you don't find, just go with me. We'll just, and, and yes, and John will just make them up for you as we go along. So that'll be okay. So I heard this story that this police officer got, uh, got sent to a house, got sent to a residence uh, in regards to a shooting that... Um, uh, supposedly someone had been shot at the house. So the officer responds there and finds out that the wife of the house has shot her husband because he stepped on her wet floor that she had just mopped, okay? And so um, the, the police get there and realize what's going on. Well, the, the sergeant calls the officer, the primary officer responding, and wants to know, have you arrested her? Have you put her in handcuffs yet? Is she in the back of the police car? And the officer said, not yet. And the, the sergeant says, why not? And he says, because the floor's still wet. <laughs> yeah, okay. You got to admit, families are pretty jacked up, right? I mean, how many of you live in a family, be honest, that isn't jacked up to some extent? And remember, if you raise your hand, liars go to the place that burns. That's right. All families have problems. We do, right? I mean, and we try to kind of keep them hidden because we, don't, we want people that like us to think we are normal, right? When the truth is, the new normal is really dysfunction. We're all, we're all screwed up. Every one of us, every family is because uh, I guess that's just the world that we live in. You know, families seem to be falling apart left and right. And, and uh, honestly, seriously, it causes a lot of problems. I mean, I, have, I see people all the time who are struggling because there's a, a problem with mom or dad. Or there's, um, there's a relationship problem that just has never been resolved. And... Uh, it started off as maybe a little grain of sand that irritates the eye. I can relate to that. And now it's like a boulder that sits in the living room of the house, and they can't move it out. They talk about the elephant that's in the, in the middle of the room. And there's no wonder when you know that those things are going on, our divorce rate is skyrocketing in this country. And literally across the world, uh, there's a deterioration uh, that seems to be rampant between husband and wife. I mean... My idea of family comes from watching Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best. But I think that family left a long time ago, you know? And I think that's, that's scary. And, and one of the things we learn real quickly is that the sins of the parents are so easily passed on to the children. You know, and then to the next generation and the next generation. And when you start to think about why that happens, the truth is Satan. I know I'm going to get all ooky spooky dooky on you, right? But the fact of the matter is, if you believe in God, you got to believe in Satan. Okay? Now, I'm not saying he's a, a negative, evil equal because he's not. You know, real quick theology lesson. Satan used to be the most glorious angel that ever existed, that God created. But Satan realized he was the most glorious, beautiful angel that God had ever created and decided he could be as good as God. Well, he actually decided he could be God. But you know something? When the creation tries to rebel against the creator, they get smacked down. And the Bible tells us that there was a rebellion in heaven kind of like the rebellions we have in our families. But as a result of that rebellion, he, Lucifer, and a third of the angels of heaven were cast out. 
and they run rampant on this planet. And they're doing everything they can to, number one, get our eyes off God, but number two, to keep us from following God. Remember last week, I said that to have revival in the church, revival has to start in the family, okay? Well, what Satan believes is this. If he can attack the family, ultimately, he attacks God. And so because of that, he has been up to this for thousands of years trying to figure out how to destroy the family because if he can destroy the family, he destroys the nation. And if he destroys the nation, he destroys the world. And that's so important. How many of you brought your Bibles this morning? Either electronic version or the old school Bible. Hey, one thing I did find out since I've been wearing glasses since Tuesday, I can actually read my real Bible again. I was convinced that somebody snuck into my office and changed my Bible to one with much smaller print. And not only was it smaller, it was more of a gray color than black. I was convinced of that. And I get the glasses on Tuesday and walked in Wednesday in the office and went, oh my gosh, I can read my Bible again. That's just amazing. That is amazing. Maybe I can even start marking it up. I don't know. But anyway, I am so glad you brought your Bibles because like I say every week, I want Thrive Church to be known as a church who knows God's Word. And the only way to know God's Word is to be in God's Word. So today what I want to talk about is this idea of Satan being in our family. And what we call that is actually the strongholds. Satan establishes strongholds in our family to hinder our family, to ultimately destroy our family. So what I want to do is kind of help us. So to begin with, if you've got your outlines, one of the first things I did for you this morning was give you a definition of the word stronghold. And it just simply is a place that has been fortified so as to protect it against attack. Now, we go back, you can go back to the military. Anytime the, the military, if they're in a battle, establishes a foothold in an area, they fortify that foothold, and literally it becomes a stronghold. You think about uh, all the castles in Europe, and every one of the castles in Europe has a, a, a big uh, iron and, and, and stone fence that goes around the castle. That's a stronghold. And they have a moat that keeps people separated from that, that area of land. That's a stronghold. Well, what Satan does is he puts strongholds into our family, not, not areas that protect us, but areas that prevent us being close to God, that keep God out, so to speak. So it's important. You know, and as I was thinking about this, I thought about probably one of the biggest strongholds, physical strongholds that was ever in, according to history, was actually around uh, an ancient city called Jericho. And I did some research this week and found out that Jericho actually had two separate walls. There were actually two walls. The city set in the middle. There was a wall around the city that was six foot tall. And then there was an area of land between that wall and the next wall, which was 12 foot tall and 12 foot wide. Now, this is the other thing. On top of that 12 foot wall was another wall that went up into high. It was super high. And so we talk about the walls of Jericho. We're actually talking about three separate walls, two on the ground and one sitting on the top of the, of the, the tallest wall, which just made this city literally uh, uh, unable to penetrate if you tried to penetrate it, which I think was a very, uh, very neat thing. But we also know what happened to the city of Jericho. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, the one thing that I do know is that even though they had these walls for protection around the city, the Bible tells us that the people inside of the city of Jericho were in fear. They were scared to death because they had shut themselves up out from the rest of the world. Look at, in, your, in your outline, Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. I gave it to you from my favorite version of the Bible, the International Children's Bible. It's the one I can understand. So here it is. It says, now the people of Jericho were afraid because the Israelites were near. So they closed the city gates and guarded them. No one went into the city and no one came out. If you're taking notes, circle the people of Jericho were afraid. They were afraid. 
understand Satan builds strongholds in our lives, and he builds strongholds in our families, and he tries to keep us from, from following Jesus. But no matter what the strongholds are that he puts in our lives, one thing we can take to the bank, he is afraid of God. Like the people of Jericho were afraid of the Israelites, Satan is afraid of God because he knows who God is. And he really understands the fact that God is more powerful than he is. In fact, in the Bible it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, you, do ch you dear children are from God and then overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is who is in the world. The one who is in the world, of course, is Satan. And you understand, he knows this. You know why? Satan knows the word of God better than anybody does. He understands the word of God better than anybody does. He does that because he uses God's word to manipulate us. He uses what God has said to change us and our thinking, hopefully, away from God. That's what he does. So Satan knows God's word. He knows that it says, greater is he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you that is in the world. He knows that. And you know what? He knows it's true. He knows it's true. But he still tries to move in our lives. Truth be told, he's just as scared as the people of Jericho were. He is. He is. Now, the Bible says that when the walls of Jericho fell, they fell flat. They just didn't fall over. They fell flat. That's the power of God. They fell flat. They were crushed. When God caused the walls to fall, they, were, they fell crushed so the children of Israel could go into the promised land. It's important because God can help us crush the strongholds in our lives, not just knock them down, but crush them. And the only way you're going to have peace, the only way you're going to have happiness in your life and in your family is if we figure out how to break the strongholds. But in order to figure out how to break the strongholds, we've got to know what they are. We've got to know what it is that we're, that we're fighting against. You know, the cool thing is that when we take that first step, we get the power of God on our side. We get the power of the Holy Spirit to help us deal with these strongholds. And Satan knows that. But the Bible says that Satan is the most crafty and the most cunning of all the creatures. He's crafty and he's cunning. And he is going to try to convince us that the strongholds in our lives and the strongholds in our family are okay. In fact, they're all right. In fact, we don't have to worry about them. Those things that we think are, are in our lives that we should get rid of, no, 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 we don't have to worry about them. They're fine. That's what he's going to whisper in our ear. And if we don't listen to him, the next thing he will do is step up the attack on us. But we need to call it like it is. And one of the things that I think is so important that we as believers get in the habit of doing is coming against him. Now, let me stop and say something here because this is not part of the sermon. <clears throat> Excuse me. For whatever reason, I know a lot of people who call themselves Christians, who call themselves believers, but when we start talking about these kinds of spiritual things, they back up. They back up. What do you mean, come against Satan? Are you crazy? And my answer to that is, are you crazy not to? People have this fear of Satan. And maybe it's the world we live in. Maybe it's the culture has glorified him as this horrible thing. You got all, these, all of these uh, horror movies, you know, that, that put him on a pedestal and make him scary. I claim what the Bible says. The Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Yeah. Now, if the Holy Spirit living in me is greater than Satan... I'm pretty simple. I mean, I just look at it like it is, and I call it like it is. Satan's a butthead. He's a loser. He sucks, okay? And I'm not afraid to tell him so. 
What's he going to do to me? What's he going to do to me? If he was going to do something to me, he would have already done it, right? But he ain't big enough or bad enough because I got the Holy Spirit who can kick him back to the mark. Now, why don't all of us act that way? Why don't we all walk in that authority? I have authority over him. If I look at him and say, you got to go, he's got to get his butt out of town. Why don't we act that way? Why don't we live that way? Why do we let him screw our families up? Why do we let him screw our children up? Huh? Why do we let him screw our nation up? Our government. I can go on and on and on. Why do we let him do that? Because we're scared of him. We're scared of him. You know the best way to deal with a bully? Punch the snot out of him. They won't hit you again. They won't hit you again. Y'all ever watch Christmas Story? That's what you do to Satan. Just try to stay away from the four-letter words while you're doing it. All right. Hey, I'm, I'm back. Okay, I'm back. But I got to tell you, he's been doing this since the beginning of time, okay? Literally, he started with the very first family. Who was the first family? Adam and Eve, right? The Bible tells us in, in, in the third chapter uh, of Genesis that he immediately attacked the first family. He immediately attacked Adam and Eve. His plan from Jump Street was to divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Divide us from God and conquer us. Divide uh, husband and wives from each other and conquer them. Divide children from their family and, and conquer them. And the bad, or the bad thing is he doesn't realize, I guess the good thing for us, he doesn't realize that when God created Adam and Eve and he placed them in the garden, the very next thing God said is, it is good. It is good. Well, the joy didn't last for long because Satan got involved, right? You see, the thing we have to understand, like I said before, is they're in this battle. Satan and God are in this battle that's lasted all of eternity. The Bible tells us, because I've read it, that at the end, Satan will be defeated. He will be defeated, right? But right now, they're going through this little battle, you know. He's, God's letting him have his way, letting him, you know, kick his feet up and throw his tantrums like a two-year-old. but he's going to be defeated. He's going to be defeated. Now, in order for us to defeat him, we need to understand what he's throwing at us. We need to understand these strongholds. So in your outline, I've listed a couple, three of the common strongholds. Now, now by no means is this an a all-inclusive list. These are three of the most common, okay? The first one is real deep. Selfishness. Selfishness. The first stronghold that Satan uses against the family is the stronghold of, of selfishness. If he can get you to believe that you'd be better off not listening to God and following God's word, if he can get you to believe that your family was designed for your pleasure and not God's, if he can get you to believe that you need to look out for number one, and if he can get you to believe that the most important thing is that you please yourself, that he's got you where he wants you. Because, see, if you believe these things, it starts being kind of narcissistic. If you believe these things, it starts looking like selfishness. That's what he did to Eve. That's what he did to Eve. Look at Genesis chapter 3. It says, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say to you, you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we can eat from the trees, the fruit of the, gar of the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we can, or that we're not allowed to eat. God says, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Now, understand right there, she said things that God didn't say. And we'll come back to that. 
You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. What is Satan doing here? <clears throat> what is he doing? Huh? Setting up. What? Setting up. He's setting her up. Sure, because his idea is to put her against Adam. Why am I saying put her against Adam? Because understand, when God laid down the rule for the garden, Eve wasn't there. Go back and read the rest of the first part of Genesis. God established the rules for the garden before he created Eve. He told Adam what he could and could not do. So therefore, Adam, as Eve's husband, told her what God had said. So what Satan was doing was putting a wedge between her and Adam. Yeah, God said it, but who told you God said it? Your husband, Adam. See, think about that. See how subtle that was? And he's been doing that ever since, trying to put a wedge between husbands and wives because if he can destroy the family, he can destroy the nation. If he can destroy the nation, he can destroy the world. He's got a plan, and it's diabolical, okay? But it's driving this wedge of doubt between Eve, her husband, Eve and her husband, Adam. He convinced her, you can become like God. He convinced her, or tried to convince her that God's a liar. He didn't really say that. You're not really going to die. And you know what? He's been duping people for centuries the same way. How does that show up today? People more than ever are convinced that God's not important. Religion's not a big deal. Or religion is the big deal. Either one of them take their focus off God. Because, see, we say it over and over and over again, Christianity's not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with the God that created you. But if Satan can convince you that God is not important, who cares? Who cares anymore? The church is not important. Who cares anymore? As long as I'm happy, as long as I can do what I want to do, everything's all right. That's what he's been trying to convince us of for thousands of years. And that is called selfishness. Selfishness. It's a stronghold that Satan puts in our lives that creates disorder. It creates disunity. And it's not just Eve. It's not just Eve. I mean, think about it. The Bible says that when, the sa when Satan was talking to her, when the serpent was talking to her, Adam was standing there. He was standing right there while the serpent was talking to Eve, and he didn't open his mouth. He kept his mouth shut. He stood there being the passive male husband. I mean, first of all, if you want to think about this, you can laugh if you want to. You want to think about this. The very first thing he should have done as, as her husband, he should have protected her. And he should have not let the serpent even talk to her. But he did. Okay? And the second thing he did, he should have not given in to what she wanted to do. He stood there as a passive male. Now, I got to tell you, that's not what God created him to be. We're going to talk about later on, what's the role of the husband and what's the role of the wife, biblically? But to be a passive male standing by, saying nothing, doing nothing, is not what God created him to be. But it was a way that Satan got into the family. It was a way he did that. Now, the second stronghold is rebellion. It's rebellion. Now, and today, psychologists tell parents, when children rebel, it's okay. They're just trying to define the boundaries. They're just trying to define the boundaries. Rebellion is wrong, people. Amen. It's wrong. It's just totally wrong. I mean, it not only affects the family, it affects everybody. It affects people outside of the family. See, Adam and Eve... 
had two sons. They actually had three. We'll talk about the first two. Okay? The first two were who? Cain and Abel. Now, we don't know their ages when all this started, but one thing we know based on the acts they were performing is that Adam and Eve taught them about God. They understood who God was. They understood what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was bad, because when we see Cain and Abel, they're in the process of making and offering a sacrifice to God. So they've learned. They've learned that, right? Now, what we see in this story is that God had clearly said, this is the way you do it. If you're going to offer me something, step one is this, step two is this, step three is this. This is the way you do it. But what we see in this story is that when Cain came into the picture, either one or two things happened. And I'm still not clear which it is. But here's what I know. Either he thought his way of offering God a sacrifice, well, this is going to sound stupid, was better than God's way of him offering a sacrifice. He could have legitimately thought that. Or two, he thought it wasn't important to do it God's way. But one of the two things happened here. And as a result, his actions literally were rebellion against God. He was literally rebelling against God, and God rebuked him for it. In Genesis chapter 4, it says, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. That doesn't sound bad. In fact, it sounds pretty cool, right? He presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs of his flock. What Abel gave God was the best. Okay? The Lord accepted Abel's and his the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. Now, I don't want to I, I can't call it an epiphany. But for a long time, I was under the belief that because Cain gave God crops, it wasn't as good. Because, you know, the, the whole system of sacrifice uh, through the Old Testament is giving God a blood offering, uh, a lamb, a dove, uh, you know, something like that, that, that a, an animal had to be killed and the blood offered to God. Okay, it's what happened with the Passover. They had to kill the lamb and put the, the blood over the door and all that stuff. We talked about that a little bit last, last week. At some point, I'm ashamed to admit it, after I graduated from Bible college and seminary, it clicked to me it had nothing to do with what the offering was, but more to do with which it was. Okay, Cain was a farmer, so he didn't have animals but what he did was grow crops. And he could look across this field. I don't know what he was growing. Let's, let's just say, because I like them, corn. Corn's amazing. God created corn. It's awesome. But let's say he had a, a, a field of beautiful yellow corn. But right in the front of the field were, were some corn stalks that, that didn't mature, and the corn didn't look as good, and... and Bugs and worms got into the corn. Wimpy corn. Uh, well, what is it called? Wimpy corn. Okay, wimpy corn. All right. That's what Cain gave God. Because the other was beautiful and yellow and ready to eat, right? So this crap he couldn't eat is what he gave to God. And when it came to me, it clicked to me that he gave some of his crop, not the best, but just some of his crop to God. It made sense to me. It's not what you give. And this is going to be really weird. It's not what you give, but it's what you give. Does that make sense? Yes. It's not what you give, it's what you give. And the what you give is the best. The best. And because Cain didn't, God said, eh, wrong, go back. Right? And he could have learned from this. My thought is, he didn't have to do what he did. He didn't have to go down in history the way he went down in history. He could have gone, oh, God, I'm so sorry. 
please forgive me. Here, have the best. And God would have said, well done. But he didn't. It says he got angry and he got dejected. His sacrifice wasn't accepted by God, and that just upset him. And he rebelled, and Satan used that rebellion to tear down his family. Understand, when a child rebels, the family suffers. I don't care what kind of rebellion it is. That's why it's so important at a very young age that we teach our children authority and respect. Authority and respect. Because they're going to have a natural tendency to push the boundary. They're going to have a natural tendency to resist because they have what we all have, and it's called a sin nature, okay? But if a child is taught properly, the Bible says he won't, he won't, he won't go away from it, okay? And there's a difference, guys. Let me just say this. There's a difference between teaching authority and teaching fear, okay? Fear... Fear is forced, but authority is earned. And there's a difference. As a parent, it's, un, it's it, imperative that we know the difference. But when rebellion's allowed to run rampant, there's going to be chaos. When parents rebel against each other, there's going to be chaos in the marriage. When a child rebels against a parent, there's going to be chaos in the family. It's Satan's tool. He knows if he can keep the family in chaos, if he can keep our lives in chaos, then we can't do a whole lot of focusing on who God is. He knows that. And we need to break the stronghold of rebellion. The third stronghold is unresolved anger. The last thing that we see happening to Cain is that he got angry. He got angry because of what happened, but he didn't get angry at himself. He got angry at God. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, God says, Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. God says sin is waiting for an opportunity. You can replace that word sin with Satan. Satan is waiting for an opportunity to get in. And guess what? If we open the door and let him in, he's going to come in. That's why we're told in James not to give place to the devil. You know, if we give him a place... He's going to take it. If we open a door, he's going to come in. So in our families, we need to resolve any, any unresolved anger, right? We don't want to carry a grudge. I believe that's why the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because Satan uses it. It becomes a stronghold. Actually, the Bible says we got to deal with it. So you know the story of Cain, those of you that don't. He played out his anger. Okay, the, the Bible says that he got so angry at God, and then he looked at Abel, who God liked for his sacrifice, and then he got bent at, at, at Abel, right? And he lured him out, and once he got him out there, he murdered him. He killed him in cold blood, and Cain will forever in the history of time go down known as the very first murderer in history for killing his brother. Now, you don't have to go murder your brother, okay, to, to lure him in a field and, and kill him to, to use unresolved anger. I mean, you can do that just as easily with words. And, in fact, anger makes us say things that in a million years we'd never say normally. I, I've been in that situation. I have. Let me tell you what. I can let it go. And, boy, I can string them together better than a sailor. And I have said some things to people sometime that the moment that it was coming out of my mouth, I realized I shouldn't be saying this, but it keeps coming. And it's just like, bleh. Problem is, once you say it, you can't take it back. You can't. You can't put it back in the tube. It's like the toothpaste deal, you know. It won't go back in the tube. Anger makes us do things we normally wouldn't do. It blinds us, and it causes us to have self-pity, and, and it causes us to feel like the whole world is against us. And that's Satan building a stronghold. You see, the Bible says, go back to Jericho, the Bible says that God told the, the Israelites to march around the city. 
Anybody remember how many times? March around and march around. Now, we know there was this great miracle that occurred. And, and I may be right. I may be wrong. This is, I don't have any biblical basis to tell you this, except that I read it and felt it. I believe God said march around the, the city seven times because he was giving the people in Jericho a chance to repent. If they'd have only repented, but they didn't, their unresolved anger burned. And as a result, they were destroyed. They were destroyed. And so if we keep our walls up or we keep our strongholds up, ultimately, what's going to happen to us? We're going to be destroyed. So with the time that I have left, which is only about 12 minutes, or Jonna will cut off my mic. And, and, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me just say real quick, uh, how do you go about breaking a stronghold? How do you go about breaking a stronghold? Because that's what we need to do. And number one is so important. We got to realize, folks, guys, we got to realize that we're fighting a spiritual battle. Yeah. We are fighting a spiritual battle. You and I are at war, whether you want to believe it or not. We are engaged in literally the war of the world, and you might not even realize it. And you got thrown into this war the moment you said, Jesus, I need you. Okay? You got a hold of the war. Actually, you were in it before, you just didn't know. Okay, you were a pawn that was being manipulated by Satan. But now that you're a believer, you, you're a warrior in this, in this war. And it started with, with, with God and Satan, and it spread to every part of the world. It's, it's rampant because Satan wants to win. And even though he knows he won't, he's like a two-year-old child, and he's going to do what he's going to do before he gets smacked down. Okay? We're in the war with him, though. Okay, we realize that everything that we see going on is literally a, a spiritual war. Let me tell you something. This is not a this is not a commercial, but I, I think about when I think about spiritual warfare, I think about this present darkness and piercing the darkness, which are two novels that were written probably 25 years ago now by a man named Frank Peretti, and they're novels. Okay, but I really believe that God gave Mr. Peretti a vision of what spiritual warfare is like. And what he shows through those two books is that when believers pray, when believers stand up to Satan, the powers of God and the angels that are part of his force stand up and fight. Yeah. But when we as believers don't pray, we're not giving them what they need to fight yeah. with. It's an amazing, amazing two books. And I would encourage you, if you haven't read them, to go read them because we are in this spiritual battle. There's no bunker or no foxhole that we can crawl into that's going to shield us from the effects of this battle except putting on our spiritual armor and going out there and fighting the war. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Most Christians don't even know there's a war going on. That's sad, guys. Others see the results of the battles in their own lives, and maybe they become casualties of it. And what I'm talking about, people who find themselves discouraged or depressed or downtrodden or defeated, and it was amazing, all those words started with D. I didn't mean that to happen, but it just did. <gasps> okay, also, it's the marital problems that go on in people's families. Uh, it's literally, it's divorce, it's conflict, it's abuse. It just shows itself in so many different ways. But at the crux of it, at the root of it, there's this spiritual war going on between the forces of evil and the forces of God. And we are part of that war and the sooner we figure it out the sooner we can start tearing down the strongholds in our own family that's so important we fight the battle but we don't fight it alone because when we realize what's going on and we're believers we take on the power of the holy spirit and that means greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world that's so important now i got to say this the only authority Satan has is what you give him. Right. Think about that just for a second. I want some coffee. Oh, God, that is so good. He created coffee. Um, <laughs> people don't realize this. This is, this is like one of my pet peeves. 
If you give Satan authority, he will take it. If you give him an inch, he will take a foot. He will take a yard. He will take a mile. And there are so many believers that say, go right ahead and take it all. The only authority he has is what you give him. When you step up and become man enough or woman enough to say, get thee behind me. You have no authority over me. You have no authority over my children. You have no authority over my family. You have no authority over my work. You have no authority over my church. That's when you kick his butt. Right. And we got to do that. Well, I got to be careful. I'm going to start preaching in a minute. You got to let your children know who God is. You got to let your children know who God is. You got to let your children know how you feel about him. The second thing we can do to tear down strongholds and just make sure your foundation is solid. We talked about this last, not last week, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. We talked about developing a foundation for your family last week. That's what you got to do. It's so important. That's why I began this series talking about that. It's so important that God is our foundation, that Jesus Christ is our cornerstone, because that's the only way stability can be brought to the family. That's the only way stability can be brought and order can be brought to our homes. I read you this verse last week, Luke chapter 6, verses 47 and 48. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me and listens to my teaching and then follows it. That's Jesus talking. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays a foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. I mean, parents, in order to break down and tear down the strongholds that are in our families, we got to decide to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I'm going to have a whole, a whole sermon on that later in this series. We've got to stand by our guns no matter what we face. And what I mean by that is, fathers, you've got to stand up. You've got to be men. You've got to be godly men. You've got to be a real man, okay? Mothers, you need to make sure that what's going on in your home is godly, okay? Children, sit down, shut up, and listen to your parents. They do no more than you. Okay, and one day you'll realize that. I've heard that story, you know. I thought my parents were stupid till I turned 25, and I was like, how in the world did they get so smart? <laughs> you know what I mean, right? Yeah. The third thing we can do to build, to, to tear down these strongholds is to build a strong marriage. I think, I think it is so important that we have strong marriages in this world because God said they were important. If it was the very first thing he created based on man and woman, then it must be important. It must be important, okay? Ephesians chapter 5 says, Wives, submit to yourself, uh, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And we stop there because it sounds good. But if we keep reading, this says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I talk about this at every wedding ceremony I perform, which probably in my lifetime is probably reaching close to 100 of those now. And I spend a lot of time talking about that. Basically, strength lies in unity. It does, so uh, we need to build a strong marriage. And the only way we do that is that we have our marriage look like the biblical account of what a marriage should look like. And most people get all freaky when I say that because, man, that sounds so sexist that a wife should submit to their husband as she does to Jesus. And it just puts the husband up on this pedestal, right? Well, no, it doesn't. Because then he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, Jesus died for the church. And what I tell every couple that I ever marry is this. The idea of biblical submission doesn't mean that he has a thumb on you. Doesn't mean he says, woman, you do this or else, or you do it my way or the highway. That's not what it means. Biblical submission starts with a husband. If a husband, if a man can show his wife 
that he loves her enough to literally die for her, she'll follow him anywhere. That's biblical submission. It's not do because I said so. It is I love you so much, I would lay down my life for you. I'd get hit by a bus for you. I'd take a bullet for you. And it's all talk, right? But if she knows that, she will follow him to the end of the earth. And that's biblical submission. Jesus never made the church do anything. Jesus loved the church enough to die for it. That's what biblical submission is all about. And we need to have families, starting with husbands and wives, husbands who love their wives enough to die for them. And wives know that beyond a shadow of a doubt and would go anywhere for them. And when husbands and wives demonstrate that, the kids figure it out. And the kids realize, I want to be just like that when I grow up. I want to be a mom just like mom. I want to be a dad just like dad. And when we do that, we are, we are breaking strongholds that are in our family. That is so important. And, and the last thing we got to do to break strongholds is the thing we always leave for last because I don't know what else to do, and that's pray, okay? Make prayer the centerpiece of your home. Make prayer number one. The reality is that even though Christians know how to pray and know they should pray, the majority of them don't pray. Why is that? It's all kinds of reasons. All kinds of reasons, I guess. But I think what it really comes down is that we don't think we need to pray. Because if we thought we need to pray, we'd pray, okay? And we don't pray because we don't think we need to pray. We think we got this. We think we can handle this on our own. We think we have the ability to resolve whatever's going on in our family. It doesn't matter what you think. The Bible says specifically in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, pray continually. It doesn't say if you want to. It doesn't say if you think about it. It doesn't say if you don't know what else to do. I mean, of all people, Jesus set the example. Of all people who shouldn't have needed to pray. He's God, right? But the Bible tells us time and time again, he started every day praying to the Father. He spent most of the time praying to the Father. He got away by himself to pray to the Father. He prayed with the disciples. He gave us the example. And if he thought it was important enough to pray, I'm pretty simple. We should pray. We should constantly be in prayer for our families, praying for support, praying for protection, praying for needs. Remember, I said at the beginning of this, we're in a spiritual battle. We're fighting a spiritual war. And one of the biggest weapons that we, as, as men and women on this planet, can use against Satan is prayer. That's what Frank Peretti showed in those two novels. When the Christians played, prayed, Satan was defeated. Bottom line, I think it's time that we begin to take the advice of Nehemiah. For those of you who don't know Nehemiah, Nehemiah was an amazing person in the Old Testament. Nehemiah uh, was a godly man, was a strong leader, and, and Nehemiah said some things that, that make a lot of sense. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, he says, Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives and your homes. He's telling us not to be afraid. He's telling us to remember who God is. He says that God is great and he's almighty and, and that he's terrible and, and he's got wrath. He's saying, fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your mom, fight for your father, fight for your dad. Whatever it is, he's saying, fight for them. The prophet Isaiah put it best, I think. It's not in your outline. In Isaiah 54, 17, he says, No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your, that you are a God who loves us. I thank you that you are a God who wants the best for us. I thank you that you are a God who has given us weapons to defeat the enemy Satan and I thank you that you've told us he doesn't stand a chance when he comes against you and Holy Spirit 
especially with Holy Spirits in our life. So I thank you for that. You're an amazing God. You are an amazing God. Keep your eyes closed just a moment. I want you to know that God loves you more than anybody ever will love you. And he wants a relationship with you. The God who created heaven and earth wants a relationship with you. And all you got to do is ask him for that. You just got to ask him, and he'll establish the relationship. I'm going to pray a small prayer, a short little prayer. If you've never prayed this prayer, I encourage you to pray this prayer with me this morning. Just say, God, I need you in my life. I know I, I've sinned. I know I've done things that are horrible, and I confess that to you right now. But I also realize I need you. I need you desperately in my life. And so right now, with all the faith I can muster, I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my life. I know you died for me. I know you went to a cross for me. And, and your word says that whosoever believeth in you shall not perish but have everlasting life. I believe you did that for me. I accept your work on Calvary. I I'm asking you for a relationship. I'm asking you to come into my life now. In Jesus' name, amen.